Greetings, mother factors. I'm Sam, and today I'm here to talk to you all about the Beatles. I should state as soon as possible, though, I will not be attempting any Scouse accent for this video. <laughs> Psych! I've got to do it every chance I get, and there ain't nothing the Beatles can do about it. Okay, let's stop there. But why, oh why, are the lyrics to I Am The Walrus so darn weird? Why was Ringo Starr symbolically beheaded in 2008? And how many Scousers can I offend by the end of this video? Haha, <laughs> I can never go to Liverpool now. Oh well, two out of three of these questions are going to be answered. So, picture yourself in a boat on a river, angrily blame Yoko Ono for everything, and do copious amounts of LSD, as we actually don't do that, please. Please don't do that last bit. <clears throat> as we count through 101 facts about the Beatles! Number one. In case you don't have the senses of sight, sound, uh, taste, or smell, that didn't work, the Beatles were an English rock band that formed in Liverpool in 1960. The band's principal group consisted of John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr, and are now widely considered to be the most influential band in history. Well, it's a toss-up between them and Papa Roach. Number two. The Beatles started off combining various genres, such as 1950s rock and roll, beat and skiffle, which sounds more like the name of a pet gerbil than a genre of music, but there you go. The band later experimented with other musical styles, such as hard rock, psychedelia, and traditional Indian music frequently incorporating classical elements and utilising unconventional recording techniques, because they were the goddamn Beatles and they could do what they want. Number 3. As such, the Beatles are often credited with the evolution of pop music, transforming it into not only a highly commercial industry, but an actual art form too. In fact, the band's music contributed significantly to the development of counterculture of the 1960s. Number 4. It all started way back in 1957, when a 15-year-old Paul McCartney met a 16-year-old John Lennon. Lennon was already in a band called The Quarrymen, and invited McCartney to join the group on rhythm guitar. The group was later joined by George Harrison and the original bass player, Stuart Sutcliffe. Oh, um, oh god, hopefully no relation. Yeah. Number 5. Prior to his ascent to superstardom, McCartney spent some time working as an electrician, an occupation at which he later described himself as hopeless. Luckily, his backup career seemed to work out. Number 6. The term Fifth Beatle has been retroactively applied to numerous individuals who played in earlier versions of the band. Such people include the previously mentioned Stuart Sutcliffe, Pete Best, Tony Sheridan, Jimmy Nickel, and Chaz Newby, among many others. Number 7. The group's various iterations went by a number of different names, which included Johnny and the Moon Dogs, which is better than the Beatles if I'm honest, the Rainbows, and Japage 3. <laughs> Number 8. No one is entirely sure exactly where the name Beatles came from, but the most widely accepted theory is that the early band member Stuart Sutcliffe came up with Beatles, you know, like a normal Beatle, which then became the Silver Beatles. Later, John Lennon suggested changing the spelling to Beatles, in reference to beat music and the beat generation. It's basically a pun, if you really think about it. The best band in the world, and it's a pun. Number 9. On the 29th of August 1959, the band performed as the Quarrymen at the opening night of the Casbah Club in Liverpool. The club was located in the cellar of a house belonging to Mona Best, the mother of Pete Best, who would later become the original drummer of the Beatles. Mona Best had even enlisted the nascent rockers to help her paint the venue before its grand opening. Grand opening? I mean, it's literally a cellar in a house. Number 10. It's difficult to find out exactly when the group made their first appearance as the Beatles. I mean, I'd ask them, but they probably can't remember. Lots of magic green smoke back in those days. Some sources suggest though that it occurred on the 18th of August 1960 at the Indra Club, on the second day of a three and a half month residency in Hamburg, Germany. Number 11. <laughs> Starting in February of 1961, the group made frequent appearances at the Cavern Club, where they were spotted by a local record store owner and music columnist named Brian Epstein, who saw the group's potential and would ultimately become their manager. Number 12. Later in 1961, Sutcliffe left the band to pursue art, with McCartney replacing him on bass. In fact, the following year, Sutcliffe sadly died following a brain aneurysm. Over a year later, in 1962, drummer Pete Best was deemed to be an insufficiently talented drummer and was, rather awkwardly, sacked. Best was soon replaced by a young Ringo Starr, completing the celebrated Fantastic Fo- Nope, sorry, that's the other people. Completing the celebrated Fab Four. So, who is your favourite Beatle? Paul, John, George, or Ringo? Let us know in our fancy YouTube poll. Number 13. At this point, the band was attempting to bag themselves a record contract, which wasn't easy. At all. The Beatles auditioned for Decca Records on New Year's Day in 1962, but they were rejected because apparently guitar bands were on the way out. Ha <laughs> ha. Big mistake. Big. Huge. But they're kicking themselves. Number 14. 
Epstein ultimately managed to get the band signed to Parlophone Records in May of 1962, and in June initiated their first recording session at the legendary Abbey Road Studios. It was all kicking off basically and planet Earth had no idea. Not even that zebra crossing, that zebra crossing didn't know it would be trampled by tourists for decades to come afterwards, the poor thing. Number 15. On the 5th of October of the same year, the Beatles released their debut single entitled Love Me Do, which peaked at number 17 on the record retailer chart. Number 16. Incidentally, Love Me Do eventually became public domain 50 years later in 2012. That means I can play it for you now. Except we can't, technically, because that only applies in Europe, and a huge portion of our viewers are Yankee Doodles in the good old US of A. Sorry, gang. Number 17. On the 22nd of March 1963, the Beatles released their debut album Please Please Me, which launched the band on the rocket of their dreams to splat dead centre into the bullseye of success. Some of that may be a metaphor. The album quickly soared to number one in the charts and led to extensive European tours attended by thousands of early Beatles fans. Number 18. Please Please Me, which is incidentally what I'd scream at girls in high school around prom season, would ultimately spend 30 consecutive weeks at the number one spot, the longest of any Beatles record. Specifically because it's the longest any album by a group has ever stayed at the number one spot of the UK album charts. Like, ever. Number 19. The fanatical, unprecedented reaction to the band was soon dubbed Beatlemania. The first time Beatlemania appeared in print was in a feature on the band entitled This Beatlemania, published on the 21st of October 1963 in the Daily Mirror. However, a Scottish former music promoter by the name of Andy Lothian claims that he coined the term while speaking to a reporter at a concert at Dundee's Caird Hall as part of the band's mini tour of Scotland in October of 1963. Number 20. The single that constituted the band's breakthrough in the United States and ignited Beatlemania among the youth of America was I Want to Hold Your Hand. Man, it was a much more innocent time back then, huh? I Want to Hold Your Hand was released on the 26th of December 1963. It would eventually sell over 15 million copies worldwide. Number 21. The band released their second album, With the Beatles, in the same year as their debut album. Incredibly, it was recorded only four months after Please Please Me was released. Busy bees, those Beatle boys. And that's alliteration. Number 22! In 1964, the British invaded America, in a friendly musical sense rather than a literal violent sense, when the Beatles arrived in the USA for the first time. The band played their first US television appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, which was watched by approximately 73 million viewers in the States, which at the time constituted almost 40% of Americans. Number 23. Now, the thing about America in the 1960s is that a lot of places were segregated by race. I know, crazy, right? These evil laws often extended to music venues, but uber-progressive John Lennon wasn't having any of it. He insisted that black Beatles fans be allowed to sit anywhere they wanted at Beatles concerts, on the threat of refusing to play. Concert promoters quickly capitulated. Number 24. The rapid success of the Beatles and their growing fan base in America saw them hold the top five places on the Billboard Top 100 for the week ending April 4th, 1964. This achievement remains a record to this day. Number 25. In 1964, the band appeared in a musical comedy film entitled A Hard Day's Night, very much the Spice World of its day. A Hard Day's Night is incidentally the name of the band's third album and its lead track. When the film was being produced, US music execs considered dubbing over the members' voices with American actors, owing to concerns that American audiences would have great difficulty understanding their Liverpudlian accents, which is, oh uh, well, it's fair enough, isn't it really? Number 26. However, the Beatles themselves were not best pleased with the proposition, with McCartney claiming that if he could understand Texan cowboys, Americans could make the effort to understand Scousers. I'm paraphrasing him a bit there, and honestly, I've cleaned up the language too. You're welcome. Number 27. The band released their fourth album, Beatles for Sale, on the 4th of December 1964. Only days earlier, Starr had his tonsils removed at the University College Hospital London. When this is reported on the news, BBC announcer Roy Williams accidentally reported that Ringo Starr had had his toenails removed which begs the question, why would that be news? But anyway, number 28. In 1964, the Israeli government cancelled a Beatles concert scheduled for the following year, owing to the belief that the band were of an insufficient artistic level and that they could not add to the spiritual and cultural life of the youth in Israel. In 2008, the Israeli government issued an apology for being the world's biggest killjoys. Number 29. At one point in the 1960s, the Beatles approached legendary director Stanley Kubrick to pitch him an idea and strap in because it's quite an idea. That idea was for him to direct a movie adaptation of Lord of the Rings, starring themselves as the main characters. I'm not making this up, this actually happened. McCartney, Starr and Harrison would play Frodo, Samwise and Gandalf respectively, with John Lennon expressing a desire to play Gollum. However, Kubrick and Tolkien obviously rejected the idea, much to the band's chagrin. Number 30. 
Despite being a singer in arguably the greatest rock band on earth, John Lennon actually hated the sound of his own voice and frequently asked for it to be disguised and masked for Beatles recordings. Ah. Number 31. On the 6th of August 1965, the Beatles released their fifth album entitled Help. My god, did they ever get any sleep? The album featured the iconic song, Yesterday, which is recognised by the Guinness Book of World Records as the most covered song in history, with at least 2,200 different artists producing their own versions of the tune. The song has been covered by the likes of Elvis, Frank Sinatra, Boys to Men, Gladys Knight and James Brown, to name but a small few. Number 32. Interestingly, the band's original title for the song was actually Scrambled Eggs, and began with the line, Scrambled Eggs, oh my baby how I love your legs, not as much as I love scrambled eggs. This incredibly silly title and frankly sexist opening lyrics were used to hold the music and phrasing in place. Number 33. Since we're on the subject of food, the Beatles made numerous culinary references throughout their career, including, but not limited to, eggs, onions, cornflakes, coffee, marshmallows, truffles, pineapple, octopus, vinegar, turkey, marmalade, tangerine, strawberries, mustard, and pies. Mix them all together and you've got a Beatles soup, and probably severe food poisoning. Number 34. Incidentally, Help was the band's first album to debut at number one. Must be all the food, I reckon. Number 35. The song Michelle, which featured on the band's sixth album Rubber Soul, released on the 3rd of December 1965, was apparently inspired by Paul McCartney's habit of singing in made-up French at parties in an attempt to pick up women. Encouraged by Lennon, McCartney turned it into a real song. Number 36. The Beatles saw continued success in the United States as they began to hold concerts at various different stadia. This included a show at Shea Stadium on the 15th of August 1965, to a then world record crowd of 55,600 people. Number 37. If I Needed Someone from Rubber Soul is the only George Harrison penned song that was ever played live by the Beatles, appearing in the set list of their 1966 tour. Number 38. The Beatles released their seventh album entitled Revolver on the 5th of August 1966. Klaus Vormann, a German author and friend of the Beatles, created the artwork for the album. The cover art consists of a drawing of the band that Vormann produced from memory, and went on to win a Best Album Cover Award and the 1967 Grammys. Number 39. There are numerous theories regarding the eponymous subject of the song Dr. Roberts from Revolver. Perhaps the most well-known explanation contends that the song was written about celebrity physician Robert Freeman, who notoriously gave his patients B12 shots laced with amphetamines. Number 40. The Beatles' song Got To Get You Into My Life from Revolver is often assumed to be another love song about a girl, but McCartney later revealed that it's actually about marijuana, even going so far as to call it an ode to pot. Number 41. At this point in 1966, the band were beginning to get sick of their brutal touring schedule, and things were not about to get better. Before performing in Japan, they received an anonymous message that read, Do not go to Tokyo, your life is in danger. This threat was taken quite seriously, owing to the opposition to the tour from the country's religious and conservative groups. As a result, roughly 35,000 police officers were enlisted to protect the group. The meaning of life. The group also caused controversy when they declined an invitation to meet the shoe-hoarding wife of a dictator, Imelda Marcos, during the tour of the Philippines in early July of 1966. A palace spokesperson described the snub by saying the band had spit in the eye of the first family, which left pretty much the entire nation extremely miffed off. Hotel staff refused to provide room service or handle luggage, escalators were switched off when the band arrived, and thugs turned up at the airport specifically to physically attack them. Brian Epstein was literally punched in the face. Literally punched in the face. Number 43. Less than a month later, the American teen magazine Datebook reprinted a quote from Lennon that had previously appeared in the London Evening Standard several months earlier, in which he said the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. This statement didn't cause much of a stir in the frankly heretical United Kingdom, but when the far more religiously zealous Americans found out about it, all hell broke loose. The controversy that ensued led to boycotts, event cancellations, protests, record burnings, and even death threats directed at the band, which isn't very Christian, guys, is it? Number 44. The reaction from angry Christians became so severe that even the rascally old Ku Klux Klan got involved, with prominent members of the organisation picketing Beatles concerts and denouncing the band as atheistic. By the way, when I say organisation, I mean terrorist group, just in case you weren't aware. Number 45. Eventually, the years of almost non-stop touring began to take its toll on the band, and after 1,400 live appearances, the Beatles made their final paid performance to the public at Candlestick Park in San Francisco on the 29th of August, 1966. Number 46. 
The last song of their last concert at Candlestick Park was Long Tall Sally, a cover of a song that was originally released by Little Richard in March 1956. The song had long been a favourite in their live repertoire since the band's early days as the Quarrymen. Number 47. Part of the reason why the Beatles stopped touring was because they literally couldn't amplify their music loud enough to compete with the screaming crowd noise. Even custom purpose-built amplifiers failed to overcome the din of their crazed wailing fans. At this point, the band started to feel like their live performances were no longer about the music and decided to make that tour their last. Number 48. The band treated themselves to a short break following the madness of their final tour. Lennon went to Spain to star in a black comedy movie called How I Won the War. Harrison travelled to India to study sitar with Ravi Shankar. McCartney worked on the soundtrack for the 1966 film The Family Way, and Starr decided to chill the F out and spend some time with his wife Maureen and son Zach. Number 49. In order to lighten up the grim and disagreeable vultures from the Jungle Book, the creators of Disney's 1967 classic animated adaptation based their characters on the Beatles, even including the mop-top hairstyles in their designs. Disney had planned on having the actual Beatles voice their characters, but that plan was discarded when Lennon steadfastly refused, allegedly saying, and I'm gonna clean up the language here, see if you can spot where, there's no way the Beatles are going to sing for Mickey Fudging Mouse. Number 40. What? No. Number 50. In November of 1966, with no plans for further shows, the band eventually returned to the studio with a more experimental approach to their music, producing what many consider to be the greatest album of all time, Infest by Papa- no, actually not them, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Number 51. The first line of the song, with a little help from my friends, was originally going to be, what would you think if I sang out of tune, would you throw ripe tomatoes at me? But Ringo changed it so not to inspire fans to pelt him with tomatoes were he ever to perform it live. Number 52. This decision may have been prompted by the aftermath of a 1963 television interview in which Harrison told the host that jelly babies were his favourite treat. Immediately after this, fans began to pelt the band with jelly babies at their live performances, an act of devotion that no one in the band found amusing. Number 53. In case you hadn't noticed already, the initials of the nouns in the title of the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is LSD, which is a very special drug that the Beatles did a lot of in the 60s. However, Lennon had consistently said that fantastical imagery was not inspired by the gang's adventures in Dropping Acid, but by Alice in Wonderland. Sure, Jan, or John. Number 54. The title of the song is actually inspired by a drawing made by his son Julian, which depicted his classmate Lucy, who was in the sky, with diamonds. Lennon recalled that it was beautiful and he immediately wrote a song about it. Number 55. Paul McCartney was inspired to write She's Leaving Home after reading a newspaper article in the Daily Mail about Melanie Coe, a teenager who ran away from home aged 17. By some bizarre quirk of coincidence, McCartney had actually already met Coe three years earlier, while appearing as a judge on television show Ready Steady Go, on which she won a mime contest. Number 56. John Lennon was inspired to write Good Morning, Good Morning after seeing an advert, or as the colonials say, commercial, for Kellogg's cereal, which Lennon used as a metaphor for the boredom he felt living in suburbia. Number 57. The final song on the album, entitled A Day in the Life, features an ultrasonic whistle that is inaudible to humans but can be heard by dogs and cats. This was included deliberately, with McCartney hoping it would send nearby pets into hysterics while their owners wondered what was going on. Jesus, that's evil, Paul. Evil! Number 58. After the album had been completed, but before it was released, the band took a demo copy to the home of American singer Cass Elliot, where they played it at full volume from an open window at 6am. None of the nearby residents complained, and instead opened their windows to listen, knowing that they were hearing unreleased Beatles music. Number 59. Since the album's release, the incredible cover art has become a separate entity in and of itself. The cover depicts the band surrounded by celebrities who, according to one of the designers, Peter Blake, were supposed to have been audience members appearing in a photo with the band after a concert. The band suggested various people, as did Blake himself. Apparently, Lennon wanted to have Austrian supervillain Adolf Hitler to appear in the crowd, but he was ultimately removed for, well, kind of obvious reasons. Number 60. American actress Mae West initially refused to give her consent for her likeness on the cover of Sgt. Pepper. Eventually, however, West changed her mind after receiving a personal letter from the band. Number 61. Similarly, American actress Shirley Temple insisted on hearing the album in its entirety before giving the band permission to use her image on the album cover, the only celebrity to do so. Number 62. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was also the first rock and roll album to include a lyrics booklet, sparking a trend that has since been superseded by unreliable lyrics websites. Number 63. The song Strawberry Fields Forever was originally meant to appear on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, but under pressure from EMI was ultimately released as a double A-side single along with Penny Lane. The Strawberry Fields in question refers to a Salvation Army home near to where Lennon lived in Walton, Liverpool, called Strawberry Field. Nintendo 64. 
Towards the end of the song, John Lennon can be heard mumbling something that many people interpreted as I buried Paul. This was used as evidence in support of a bizarre conspiracy theory that McCartney actually died in a car crash in 1966 and had been replaced with an imposter. In reality though, the words Lennon is actually saying at the end of the song are cranberry sauce. It's just as likely. Number 65. Fans were so relentless in their never-ending quest to steal the street sign of Penny Lane in Liverpool that eventually the street name was painted directly onto buildings so they wouldn't have to keep replacing them. Number 66. During the summer of 1967, the band planned to buy a number of islands in Greece where they planned to live and work together with family and friends, far away from music executives and screaming fans. However, by the time they gained permission from the Greek government to purchase said islands, the band had moved on. Number 67. Sadly, on the 27th of August 1967, the band's manager Brian Epstein died of an accidental barbiturate overdose. The band was obviously extremely shocked and saddened by Epstein's death, and it's this event that many people pinpoint as the beginning of the end for the Beatles. Number 68. Still, the Beatles continued to create new music. In 1967, the Beatles released Magical Mystery Tour, which included several new songs, including one of the most popular tracks to date, I Am The Walrus. The album was released as a double EP in the United Kingdom and an LP in the US. Number 69. That song was inspired by a letter Lennon received from a student at his old secondary school, who said his teacher was conducting a class analysing the lyrics of the Beatles. This inspired the fantastical, bizarre lyrics of I'm the Walrus, as the whole purpose of the song was to confuse and befuddle listeners. Number 70. At one point, I Am The Walrus was banned by the BBC because of apparently intolerable lyrics, which included the line, Cravelocker fishwife, pornographic priestess, boy you've been a naughty girl, you let your knickers down. The ban wasn't lifted until five years later in 1972, and also what on earth is a Cravelocker fishwife? Number 71. Similarly, several other Beatles songs, including Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and A Day in the Life, were both banned for apparent drug references. This policy was apparently applied with some selectivity, however, as certain songs like Tomorrow Never Knows were never banned, despite having been inspired by taking Lennon's experiences with LSD. Number 72. George Harrison's song Blue Jay Way, which appeared on the Magical Mystery Tour, has led to the repeated theft of that street sign in Los Angeles. The song was so named as it was written at a house on Blue Jay Way in the Hollywood Hills. Number 73. Just before the three minute mark in the band's iconic 1968 song Hey Jude, McCartney can be faintly heard saying, Oh fudging hell, after making a mistake during the song's recording. Lennon insisted that it be kept in, just faint enough that few people would notice it, but they would know that it was there. Number 74. Hey Jude features a piano led intro that lasts almost a minute before the drums kick in. According to McCartney, when the Beatles recorded Hey Jude, Ringo had stepped out to go to the toilet as the rest of the band went for a take, and only just made it back to come in on time. This was the take that was actually used for the song itself. Number 75. Hey Jude is also the longest song by the Beatles, clocking in at 7 minutes and 15 seconds. Is what an incorrect person would say. Though Hey Jude is often stated as the band's longest track, this honour actually goes to Revolution 9, which appeared on the band's eponymously named 1968 album, often called the White Album, for its minimalist cover. The song plays for a whopping 8 minutes and 22 seconds. Number 76. A month after marrying Japanese artist Yoko Ono in March of 1969, John Lennon changed his name, adding Ono as a middle name, making his full name John Winston Ono Lennon. Ono oh Lennon. <laughs> Number 77. It was during the recording of the White Album that cracks began to show. In the band, I mean. The band was arguing between themselves, leading to so much tension that at certain points they were recording in separate studios. Starr even quit for two weeks after McCartney criticised his drumming. The presence of Lennon's wife Yoko Ono is often credited as the principal reason for the band's demise, though McCartney himself has since denied that this was the case. Number 78. Cult leader Charles Manson claimed that there were hidden meanings in the song Helter Skelter, which appears on the White Album. He believed that the song contained a decoded prophecy for an apocalyptic race war, which absolutely meant that his followers should go and kill several people. What a kook. Number 79. The band's 10th studio album, Yellow Submarine, was released in 1969 in conjunction with a surreal animated musical fantasy comedy film of the same name. The film was inspired by the music of the Beatles and tells the story of how the band are enlisted to help save a music-loving fantasy world called Pepperland from the Blue Meanies, a race of evil buffoonish music haters. My god, what were these guys on? <laughs> oh, oh yeah, right. Number 80. 
In April of 1969, the Beatles released a single called Get Back, which eventually went to number one in numerous countries, including the United Kingdom, the United States, Ireland, Canada, the Netherlands, Australia, France, Mexico, and Austria, to name but a few. The song is also notable as being the only song on which another artist is credited. That artist is Billy Preston, who has subsequently also been called the Fifth Beatle, as well as the Black Beatle, because Preston is, in fact, black. Real creative. Number 81. Tensions continue to rumble among the band, such that their final performance ultimately became their most iconic. On the 30th of January 1969, the Beatles made their final live performance on the rooftops of Apple Corps on Savile Row. Number 82. The worldwide number one album Abbey Road was released on the 26th of September 1969. Frankie Blue Eyes Sinatra described the Beatles song Something, the second track on Abbey Road and one of the relatively few Beatles songs written by George Harrison, as the greatest love song ever written. Now I know which song I'll be singing outside Jennifer Lawrence's house this week, accompanied by a five-piece mariachi band. Off we pop, fellas! Number 83. The final track on the album, entitled Her Majesty, is the shortest song by the Beatles, clocking in at only 23 seconds long. Number 84. The iconic album cover for Abbey Road was shot in just 10 minutes. The group had originally planned on calling the album Everest and shooting the cover together in the actual Himalayas. Instead, photographer Ian McMillan, sitting atop a stepladder, photographed the band walking away from the studio, a poetic reflection of the group's impending demise. Number 85. Quite accidentally, the album's cover also shows a Volkswagen Beetle behind George Harrison, yet another instance of the fifth Beetle. <laughs> See what I did there? Number 86. Several months later, on the 10th of April 1970, Paul McCartney announced he was leaving the group, the first to do so publicly, and the Beatles finally broke up. The dissolution of the band has been attributed to several sources, Brian Epstein's death, Harrison's emergence as a songwriter, rumoured meddling from Yoko Ono. Ultimately though, artistic differences and animosity made the band's continued existence impossible, and so the Beatles were done. Number 87. Following the breakup of the band, their final studio album, Let It Be, was released on the 8th of May 1970. The album is now widely regarded as a complicated finale for the world's greatest rock band. Number 88. The closest the Beatles came to reuniting after their 1970 split was at Eric Clapton's wedding, when he married his second wife, English model and photographer, and ex-wife of George Harrison, Patty Boyd, in 1979. Which must have been very awkward. McCartney, Harrison and Starr all played, but Lennon did not attend. Number 89. Lennon's eyesight became so bad in the 70s that without his glasses, he was legally considered blind. Number 90. On the night of the 8th of December 1980, roughly 10 years after the breakup of the Beatles, John Lennon was murdered outside his residence in New York City. His killer was Mark David Chapman, a deranged former fan who was apparently upset by Lennon's comment about Jesus and the perceived hypocrisy of the anti-materialist lyrics in his classic 1971 song, Imagine. At 10 minutes to 11, Chapman shot Lennon five times in the back using hollow point bullets, causing so much damage that doctors stated that even if he had sustained his wounds in the middle of an operating room with a whole team of surgeons ready to work on him, he still would not have survived. Lennon was pronounced dead on arrival at New York's Roosevelt Hospital at 11.15 p.m. Number 91. The aftermath of Lennon's murder was severe, immediate, widespread, and in many ways, unprecedented. On the 14th of December, millions of people around the world observed 10 minutes of silence held in Lennon's memory, during which every single radio station in New York City went off air. 30,000 people gathered in Liverpool to pay tribute to Lennon, and at least 225,000 people in New York converged in Central Park to do the same. At least three Beatles fans are known to have committed suicide as a result of Lennon's murder. Number 92. In 1985, Ringo Starr became the first Beatle to become a grandfather, with the birth of his granddaughter Tasha Jane Starkey on the 7th of September 1985. Number 93. At around 3.30 a.m. on the morning of the 30th of December 1999, a paranoid schizophrenic by the name of Michael Abrams broke into Friar Park, George Harrison's Victorian mansion in Oxfordshire. He then attacked the former Beatle with a knife. Though Harrison later downplayed the seriousness of the attack, he was ultimately stabbed roughly 40 times by Abrams, who believed that the Beatles were witches from hell who rode broomsticks and that Harrison himself was an alien. Abrams was subdued by Harrison's wife Olivia, who hit him repeatedly with a fire poker and lamp, and incredibly, Harrison survived. Number 94. However, less than two years later in 2001, George Harrison died of lung cancer at a friend's home in Los Angeles, aged 58. Harrison had previously undergone radiotherapy in 1997 to treat throat cancer, which he ultimately blamed on a lifetime of smoking. Almost £100 million were left in Harrison's will, which was distributed among his friends, family, and various charities. Number 95. According to EMI estimates since their debut in the early 1960s, the Beatles have sold over 1 billion units worldwide, making them the best-selling musical artists of all time. 
The band sold over 178 million albums in the United States and are ranked number one on Billboard magazine's list of the all-time most successful Hot 100 artists. Number 96. The Beatles have spent a record 1,278 weeks on the Billboard chart, which works out at over 24 years. Of that, 175 weeks were spent at the number one spot in the UK. The band also spent 132 weeks at number one in the United States, by far the most of any artist. Second place is occupied by Garth Brooks, weirdly, with a relatively puny 52 weeks. Number 97. The Beatles have also been awarded three Brit Awards, seven Grammy Awards, 15 Ivor Novello Awards, and an Academy Award for Best Original Song for the 1970 documentary Let It Be. Number 98. Only a month after Atopia, a tribute to the Beatles, was unveiled in Liverpool in 2008, the leafy figure representing Ringo Starr was beheaded <coughs> after he stated he missed nothing about his hometown. Number 99. One bizarre aspect of being a fan of the Beatles is the highly controversial matter of orthography. The question is, should the T in the THE in THE Beatles be capitalised? Advocates of the uppercase T cite conventional grammatical rules regarding trademarks, whereas proponents of the lowercase T point to handwritten letters by Lennon. The squabbling became most fierce in 2004 on the online encyclopedia Wikipedia and ultimately recently resulted in several editors being banned from commenting. Number 100 right now over me. John Lennon and Paul McCartney once began writing a play about a Liverpudlian man who thought he was God, titled Pilchard, though they never finished it. Good, because that sounds like it could have ruined them. <laughs> na, 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 101. For the eighth episode of the fifth season of Mad Men, entitled Lady Lazarus, the show's producers paid $250,000 to use the song Tomorrow Never Knows by the Beatles. Mad Men creator Matthew Weiner felt that the use of the original recording was important to authentically capture the culture of the era. I could think of better ways of spending 250 grand, but hey, you do you, Weiner. So that was 101 Facts About The Beatles! Did you enjoy yourself? What's your favourite Beatles song? And hey, which band do you want to see us do next? Let us know in the comments down below. In the meantime though, give this video a like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Also, click that little bell so that YouTube actually gives you our videos. That'd be nice. In the meantime, one of two videos on screen now is sure to whet your appetite. Let's get it soaking by clicking on one of them. Ugh, shouldn't have said that. Anyway, see you next time. Goodbye.